Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Princeton University uh, Council of Science and Technology Evnin Lecture. Uh, the support for this um, annual public lecture series comes from the generous donation of Tony B. Evnin, who is an alum, class of 1962, and he's director of the biotech company Venrock Associates. So we at the council um, gratefully acknowledge his donation. My name is Naomi Eric Leonard, and I'm Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering and Director of the Council here at Princeton. Um, the Council, also known as CST, uh, fosters university-wide engagement in science and technology and engineering, uh, and increased um, inclusion. And we do this by promoting innovative, innovative teaching and research, by exploring the societal impact of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, and by envisioning and facilitating new ways to live at the intersections of STEM with the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences. One of our goals is to ensure that all of our students who graduate from Princeton can be exemplary citizens, voters, and leaders uh, in particular with the ability to assess and appreciate the science and engineering issues of the day. So tonight I have the very great pleasure to introduce to you um, a scientist at the forefront of environmental research and environmental justice. Tyrone Hayes is professor of integrative biology at UC Berkeley and a worldwide expert on the role of steroid hormones on the development of amphibians. To quote my colleague Brian Herrera, he is also an engaged citizen who thinks deeply about the world we share and of the role of scientific rigor and expertise in a time when the meaning of expertise is shifting. His work and his commitment to environmental justice are beautifully aligned with what we do at the Council uh, the events that many of you maybe know about that unfolded after Professor Hayes discovered the adverse effects on frogs of the herbicide atrazine have been covered in the popular press extensively by the New Yorker. Um, and so we find ourselves greatly privileged to have him here in person to share with us his work and his story. So please join me in welcoming Professor Tyrone Hayes to Princeton. So I want to start by thanking you for having me out tonight. And I want to thank you for your time and for, for coming to hear my story. Before I tell you my story, though, I'd like to, I, I always start by giving my acknowledgments. This is a phrase that I learned by, while working in Southern Africa. And I won't try to pronounce it closer, but loosely translated, it means people are people through other people. So I don't tell my story without thanking the people who made it possible. First and foremost, my family. This is an old photograph, and they won't let me be in them anymore. But my family back in South Carolina for their love and support, especially my father, my mother, Romeo and Susie Hayes. I'm a biologist, so I'm acutely aware that without them, I truly would not be here. So I thank them for their 52 years of support. And then my wife, Catherine Kim, for her love and support over the last 31, in fact, next week is our 33rd anniversary, actually. Um, and I know without her, of course, these two wouldn't be here, my son and my daughter. And, and this is also an old photograph that I like to show. It's their old prom picture. And, and I don't know what made me prouder, that my son borrowed my tie for his prom or that my daughter borrowed my earrings for her prom. It was, it was one of those proud daddy moments of, you know, after 18 years of, no, daddy's earrings are too grown up for you. She, she and her friends finally got to go through my stuff. So I also want to thank the funding sources. Um, over the last 30 years, everybody, the, the names in red there is also my disclosure. I have been funded by the chemical manufacturers, um, but, but not anymore. <laughs> somebody once said, if you're not pissing somebody off, maybe you're not doing anything important. By that measure, I'm a pretty important guy. <laughs> 
I pissed a lot of people off. Then I want to thank all of the students that have been involved in the work. Everybody in blue is an undergraduate. Um, and I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate myself. And I've been trying to, trying to give that back. And that includes uh, the more recent students in my laboratory, including Harrison, who's here in the audience. And my most recent laboratory, one of the other things I've really enjoyed at Berkeley is working with an incredible diversity of students. And that includes a number of students who grew up with families, with parents who worked in the agricultural industry. So it's given me a whole new perspective. Finally, I want to dedicate this, as always, to my, to my grandmother, who luckily for me, before she passed away, she passed on her love of education and her desire to make the world a better place through edu education. One of the things I also learned from my grandmother and from my father that you can't learn in fancy places like Harvard and Berkeley is that if you want to get a point across, don't preach, don't teach, just tell a good story. So I want to tell you a story tonight. And that story will start and end, first and foremost, with a little boy who likes frogs. Above all else, I'm just a little boy who likes frogs. And I always start with this book. This is a book that my mom sent me when my son was born. And she wrote a note in there. She said, this was your dad's favorite book. I don't remember the book. <laughs> but as, far as, I, as long as I can remember, I've been trying to answer this question, what is a frog? What makes a frog work? And a lot of those questions started here. This is my grandmother's house, incredibly significant in my story. My grandmother's grandfather built that house. My grandmother was born in that house. My mother was born in that house. My grandmother still had the bill of sale for her grandmother when she died in that house. The other thing that's important in this house is there was this, I thought, was this huge Amazonian forest behind her house. There it is, compliments of Google Earth. There's the house. I remember this being as large as the Amazon. It wasn't, but OK. The other thing I remember, though, is that is where I chased snakes. That is where I watched birds. And that is where I fell in love with these organisms. And I fell in love with frogs in particular for a very special reason. You could see their development from the time that the sperm meets the egg without any fancy instruments or anything. I watched bird eggs, and I knew there was something going on inside there, but I couldn't see it. My mom, I had a little brother who was six years younger. We didn't have ultrasound back then. I knew something was going on, but I couldn't see it. But with frogs, I could watch. You can see now there are several cells here. A few more hours, it'll look like this. A few more hours, and each one of those dimples is a cell that all started from the fusion of these two cells of sperm and egg. In a few more hours, they go through gastrulation and neurulation, just like we do, except I could see it. The other thing that was different is that these animals developed into a fully functioning, swimming, breathing organism, a tadpole. But then unlike other vertebrates, they completely transform into a new organism. And there were things that were obvious to me as a four or five year old, however, like the tail goes away and it grows legs, and the gills go away and it grows lungs. And what fascinated me, even at that age, is how do these parts know what the others do? How does the tail know what the legs are doing? If the tail went away before you had legs, it'd just be a ball. It couldn't move. If the gills went away before it had lungs, it couldn't breathe. And what's more is all these parts had to be coordinated with changes in the environment. If you metamorphose too early, you're too small to feed. If you metamorphose too late, the pond might dry up. And all of these changes, all of these developmental physiological changes are coordinated, I learned later, by hormones that also send signals from the environment to make sure that these coordinated changes happen at the correct time. Now, the same thing that made these organisms accessible to me makes them accessible to chemicals that interfere with that process. So I would learn later, there's no eggshell, there's no membrane. So the same way that I had access, chemicals that might interfere with those hormones also had access. Now, the other thing I became interested in is, is this behavior. Frogs are incredibly altruistic. So for example, the frog on top there has hurt its leg. The one on the bottom is nice enough to give it a ride home. You don't see that. <laughs> that's, that's a joke, folks. You know, I know we're not all biologists here, but. I think the punchline of the joke, which I can't tell, 
and see what happens when a friend helps you out because they lay these eggs on the way home. <laughs> and, it, and it turns out in this particular species, they lay the eggs in these large communal clumps because each one of these little clutches is about 2,000 eggs, but hundreds of females might all lay their eggs in the same spot. And that creates a temperature gradient whereby the eggs in the middle might be as much as 10 degrees warmer than the eggs on the edge. That means that by choosing to get there first, a female could affect the development and growth of her offspring. 10 degrees warmer means that you're going to develop faster, you're going to grow faster, you're going to metamorphose faster, and you might even be able to manipulate the sex ratio of your offspring because in some fish and reptiles in particular, temperature can affect whether or not you grow testes or ovaries. So I became interested in this question. Here are testes and here are, you know, one of the things I can promise you tonight is that you will probably see more frog gonads tonight than you will in the rest of your life. I can't promise you much, but that I can promise you. And so I became interested in, can temperature determine whether or not you grow testes or whether or not you grow ovaries in, in this type of scenario with these wood frogs as the species? And then I became interested in what are the boundaries of genetics? What boundaries are there sex chromosomes that may limit or put boundaries on whether or not you develop testes or ovaries? So I looked for sex chromosomes in these animals to try to understand that interaction between, between genes and the environment. So here's where we're at in my story. A little boy who likes frogs grows up, goes to Harvard. This is work from my undergraduate thesis. This is, this is back when, I always like to tell the young people, this is back when cut and paste literally meant cut and paste. This is before Microsoft Adobe Fox. It actually meant you cut it out, you paste it on the page. And here I am at age 19. There's my professor, Bruce Wallman. I was actually in an REU program this summer. That's why that's been so, so important to me. There's uh, Sarah, who, who I think went into something else, because she doesn't look as excited as I was to be in a swamp at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning, but this was like a dream come true for me. And it was a pivotal point in my career at Harvard. If it hadn't been for this man who told me, one day you're going to be a great scientist, who had no reason to believe in me at that stage in my career, and my wife, I don't know if I ever would have finished my degree at that place. One of the other things I dreamed about as a child was going to Africa. I remember my dad, who laid carpet, would bring home these National Geographic magazines. And I remember folding out the maps and dreaming of going to this magical place. And it was a dream. My father made $9,000 a year for, the family of, for a family of five. First time I ever got on an airplane was when I went to college. So it was a dream, completely out of the realm of possibility. But in graduate school, I not only got to go to Africa, but National Geographic paid for it. I got to be on the show. I got to be in the magazine. I got to be in a Toyota commercial. <laughs> you can Google it. It's called Remarkable Men Drive Remarkable Toyotas. <laughs> but if you can imagine becoming that guy, becoming that person that you dreamed about as a little kid, that happened to me in graduate school. I got to work in a place called the Arabuku Sukoke. And the cool thing about working in Africa is you get to say words like Arabuku Sukoke. None of you have ever done that, I bet. While I was working the Arabuku Sukoke in the coast of Kenya, I discovered the kind of thing that just really excites a little boy who likes frogs. Hyperolea zargus. The males and females look like they don't even belong to each other. So I became interested about and how do they get to be differently colored? Why are they differently colored? I brought some of these animals back bred them in the laboratory, and the first thing we discovered, well, now we had Adobe Photoshop, so cut and paste looks a lot nicer, huh? So that's the same individual photograph once a day for six days. We discovered that they all start out green, and then the females change color at reproductive maturity or at puberty. So then we formulated a hypothesis, because see, now I'm a grown-up scientist. I have to have a hypothesis, and our hypothesis was that estrogen makes them change color. So in the same way that in humans, if you have ovaries when you reach puberty, estrogen makes your breasts, your mammary glands grow. We hypothesize that when these frogs reach puberty, estrogen makes them change color. Really simple question, which required a really simple test. 
we just dip the frogs in hormone solution, like litmus paper, literally. So if you dip them in testosterone, nothing happens. But if you dip them in estrogen, they'll start to change pattern and color. Now, here's where the story gets weird. It's already weird, you might be thinking, but boy. <laughs> put on your seatbelt and hang on. Because I was giving this talk almost exactly 27 years ago, on February 15th, 1993. And I remember the date exactly because it's the day before my son was born. My wife was in the audience. I was giving a talk at UC Davis on my color-changing frog. And my wife literally went into labor in the middle of my talk. So we're driving back from UC Davis to Oakland where my son was born. And my wife, who had the MBA and the MPH, said, you should patent that frog. And I thought I was crazy. I thought it was the hormones and the contractions talk. And I said, you can't patent a frog. She called her brother. And he said, oh, you can patent a frog. Here's two four to be referred to. He's a lawyer, right? And so we did. We patented this frog. We called it the Hyperolis argus. That's the species endocrine screen or the haze test. <laughs> and let me just keep it real with you. The reason you patent a frog if you're a little boy who likes frogs is because then you could say, it's my frog. <laughs> but the scientific reason is the following. I told you they all start out green. And we give them estradiol. This is the natural estrogen that circulates in every vertebrate animal. Doesn't matter if you're a frog, a dog, a cat, a hog, or a human. If you're a sexually mature female, this hormone circulates through your body, and it makes my frog change color. If we give them ethanyl estradiol, the synthetic estrogen used in birth control pill, my frog will change color. If we give them DES, the pharmaceutical estrogen, my frog will change color. If we give them DDT, not a hormone, not a steroid, but an insecticide that happens to bind the estrogen receptor, they'll change color. We screened dozens of compounds, and we found out that every compound that made my frog change color you can call it mine because I had a patent, was also known to promote breast cancer. So we had a little frog that we could raise by the, that the size of your pinky nail. We could raise them by the tens of thousands, and we could dip them in solutions and figure out which ones were breast, causes, breast cancer promoters. You could send me a sample of your water. I'd dip my frog in it. I'd be like, oh, you might not want to drink that. <laughs> What's more is we showed that we could block the color change with tamoxifen, which is the estrogen blocker that's used to treat breast cancer, with breast cancer being the number one cancer and women with cancer being the number two cause of death. So it was a big deal. Well, the next thing that happens is, little boy who likes frogs, that's me, get introduced to some grown-up words. And I think grown-up words always come in two. I don't know why I say that. I'm just making that up. In this case, the grown-up word was intellectual property. See, I don't know if you know this, but if you're enrolled at this university or if you're on the salary at this university, they own your intellectual property. They weren't downstairs cleaning frog tanks and what, but it was their intellectual property. And they said, if you don't show us how you're going to make money on it, we're going to sell it to somebody who will. So my wife had the MBA and the MPH, and I had the PhD and the frog patent. And so we started this company called Sokoke and thought we'd make a little bit of lettuce on the side, you know. And we got our first customer, a little company called Navarro, I'm being obnoxious, the largest chemical company in the world at the time, asked me to assay their number one selling product, atrazine. And I, you know, let me just be straight with it, because I like to keep it real. I don't make this stuff up. If I did, I'd tell you. I'm no chemist. I'd never heard of atrazine. Now it's like we're bound at the carbon bond. <laughs> if you Google atrazine, you get Tyrone. If you Google Tyrone, you get atrazine. In fact, chemistry was so hard on me, it almost kept me from being with you here tonight. In fact, it was so nice, I took it twice. I did not fail, however, because I don't know what y'all do at Princeton, but nobody fails at Harvard. That's because their letter grades are A, B, C, D, E. I spent a whole semester trying to convince my mama that the E stood for excellent. <laughs> The point is, for you young people, you can have a little setback and still come back. So don't worry about that. Here's what atrazine is. It's an herbicide. It's a weed killer used on corn mostly, been used since 1958. We use 80 million pounds per year. At the time, it was the number one selling agrochemical in the world. It's used in more than 80 countries, but now it's outlawed in all of Europe. Now, let me tell you the truth, because their lawyers like to write to me about this slide. They say it's not true. According to their lawyer for Syngenta Novartis, atrazine has not been outlawed in all of Europe. It has been 
denied regulatory approval by the European Union. <laughs> now, I don't know what the difference is, but I know that this slide pisses them off. So this is a slide that I use because that's just the kind of brother I am. You know what I'm saying? The point is, the companies based in Europe, they just got bought by China. And, they're, and we're using 80 million pounds of a chemical that's not even allowed in the company that owns it. That's, that's suspect, if you ask me. So what they asked me to do is they asked me, they said, we want you to look at another African frog. Africa plays a big role in the story tonight. The African clawed frog, Xenopus levis. Who knows about the African clawed frog, Xenopus? Who knows why we use it so often in developmental biology? Because it's a funny story. I'm going to tell it to you, rest of people. Turns out in 1920, somebody discovered that the human pregnancy hormone will make this frog lay eggs. So by 1940, this frog was the pregnancy test. I'm not making this stuff up. If I did, I tell you, it's 100% true. If 1940, if you thought you were pregnant, you'd go to the doctor, they'd inject some urine into the frog, and if it laid eggs, you were either happy or sad, depending on your situation. <laughs> now, I tell you this story for three reasons. Because I tell my students, don't waste people's time. If you're going to show a slide, at least have three things that you want to share. One is, this shows you the value of curiosity-based research, right? Who's the first girl I thought, hey, you know, I wonder what will happen if I inject pee into a frog. Like, what? what was the hypothesis? Did they try snot first? Did they try blood first? Like, how do you come up? But you see how important it is. The second reason I tell you the story is because it shows you the similarity between our hormones and frog hormones. The estrogens that make my frog change color also promote breast cancer. The human pregnancy hormone that's responsible for all of you and the next generation is so similar to this frog's, it'll make it lay eggs. So if you don't care about frogs, if you're not a little boy or girl who likes frogs, you should be worried about what I'm going to tell you about atrazine, because you should be worried about what it'll do to you because of these similarities. The third thing, I guess, is it's important to know is that when they develop new pregnancy tests, people just threw these frogs out. So instead of ordering them from some company, I can actually go to San Diego and collect my frogs for free from my studies because they've been released there, which technically makes mine African-American clawed frogs. But that's, a, <laughs> that's beside the point of this story. I probably have the only African-American clawed frog colony in the US. So we discovered while working with this company that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box in males. Here's why that's important. Because male frogs sing and female frogs don't for the same reason that, in general, men have deeper voices than women, testosterone. So these data implied something's wrong with the testosterone. And the last thing you want to hear, if you're the biggest chemical company in the world, is that your number one selling product might be interfering with testosterone. So then we formulated a hypothesis, because I'm still a grown-up scientist. And our hypothesis was that something must be wrong with the gonads. In fact, I made you a promise. You're probably going to see more frog gonads in this slide alone than you will for the rest of your life. Because this is a frog exposed to atrazine that has testis, then it has ovaries, then it has a large testis, then it has some more ovaries. <laughs> this, frog, this frog could hurt his leg and give itself a ride home. And, and, that, and that's not normal, meaning that frogs are not naturally hermaphroditic. So we saw that there is a problem here. So we formulated a hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that a testis, this yellow circle, should normally produce testosterone. Who, know, who knows what testosterone means? It's a portmanteau. Who knows what a portmanteau is? I didn't learn that word until I was 49 years old. <laughs> it's when you stick two words together, like smoke and fog, you get smog. Twist and jerk, you get twerk. So testosterone <laughs> is a portmanteau that literally means testicular hormone. OK? Shout out to J-Lo. Our hypothesis was that atrazine induces aromatase, the enzyme that converts testosterone into estrogen. Estrogen meaning the generator of estrus, another portmanteau. And that's fine if you're a female, but if you're a male, it means you're using up your testosterone. And now you're making estrogen when you, when you shouldn't. So we tested this hypothesis. We measured blood levels of testosterone in control males. Here's our atrazine-treated males, and here's our females. Their testosterone levels are not different from a female. So we published a paper, hermaphroditic 
Demasculinized frogs have to exposure to herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. And we didn't just publish a paper, we published it in PNAS. You know PNAS, Proceedings in the National Academy of Science? You know PNAS? My mama don't. But I called my mom, because I call my mom every Sunday. I called my mom and I said, Mom, I have a paper coming out in PNAS. It was significant, because I was about to come up for tenure. That's where, we're in, that's where we are. I'm a story right now. I said, Mom, I have a paper coming out in PNAS. My mom says, how do you get a paper cut on your penis? And I said, no. <laughs> My mom had no idea what I was talking about. She called me back the next Sunday. She said, how important was that paper? I said, really important. She said, because I went to Barnes & Noble. They never heard of that magazine. <laughs> 100% true story. I don't make this stuff up. If I did, I'd tell you. This is now my most important publication. It's a kid's book that was written about my work. My mom can buy it in Barnes and & Noble. And I, and I show this because if, if we get to the end tonight, it's an important commentary that we do things in the ivory tower. We pat each other on the back and promote each other for things that mean nothing to 99.999% of the world. And I think that's something that needs to change. So as important as this, and by the way, four black men and a Latina co-authored this paper. It's probably a record for the National Academy. <laughs> I'm proud of that. But as important as the paper was, it didn't answer some important questions. We didn't know if these hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes. Sounds like an easy question to answer, except frogs don't have sex chromosomes. That's what I figured out with all that cut and paste in as an undergraduate. But we had a good idea. It was males developing ovaries. We also didn't know what happens when they become adults. Do they stay hermaphrodites? Do they become females? Do they become males? Sounds like an easy question to answer, except it takes these animals about four, sometimes five years, to reach sexual maturity. In fact, it took us longer than that to figure this out. And here was the answer. They hurt their legs all the time. Here was the answer. I published this later in PNAS. I'm, I'm going to tell you what you're looking at in a second. And, and I sent this photo. I said, I want this to be on the cover. And, and they said, no, no. <laughs> National Academy ain't ready. Because see, by the time the paper came out, there's a gene that is expressed in females that males don't have. And so we could figure out that this guy on top, who looks like he's smiling here, he's a genetic male. That's his brother. So about 10% of these genetic males that develop ovaries grow up to completely become females. They lay eggs and everything. She's a grandmother now. Wow, she's dead now. But she was a great grandmother before she died. Ah, ah, I probably could have published that. But I had tenure. I was in no hurry. So I wanted to ask some questions about what happens to the males that don't turn into females. Are they just completely resistant or not? And so I wanted to do some mate choice experiments. Except the problem is these frogs breed in the spring. And as you may know, so do undergraduates. So it's hard to get them to stay around for spring break. You know, They want to talk about some kind of pool party thing or something. So I had to figure out a way to make this happen. It's a 100% true story. I don't make this stuff up. And so I decided in 2008, spring break 2008, I said, what if I throw the pool party? <laughs> Snoop Dogg won't be there, but what if, how many, how many students out here, how many of you would do that? You get a spring break pool party and a PNAS paper. Would you do that? OK. Went something like this. This is a 100% true story. I don't make this stuff up. This is our apparatus. And so here's what I designed. We put four females in there. We put four control males, four atrazine-treated males. I know this ain't the sex ratio you want at the club, but the idea is we wanted to see if these atrazine-treated males were competitive. So we put them in the pool. So that's how it looks at 7 p.m. And see, there they are. They're swimming around. And then we, and the lights go out at 7 p.m. We put on a little Marvin Gaye. You young people don't know nothing about that. But you come back the next morning and see there's threads in there. You see we have stitches. You know, so you, could, so you can tell who's who. So we come back the next morning, we ask, who got the hookup? And it turns out, real simple, so it turns out if you do this, the atrazine-treated males almost never get the female. Only two cases. We did this four times. Everybody was a virgin. Nobody had ever seen a male before. Actually, we did it five times, but one of the times, one of the students, Vicky Corey, she kicked the pool, and she broke him up. And she, she had to find another job after that. But the other thing we did is, we measured the hormone levels, because I'm an endocrinologist, not just a behavioral biologist. And so it turns out, if you measure the control males, on average, they have more testosterone than the atrazine-treated males. 
as you might guess. What's more important, though, is if you look at who made the love connection, so these are the individual data, there seems like there's a cutoff, and these atrazine-treated males don't make enough testosterone, so either the females don't like them, or the control males just beat them up. So we, we had something. We had something, we thought. In fact, I could have published that, but I had tenure. I was in no hurry. The next thing I wanted to know is, forget the competition. Are these males that are exposed to atrazine competent at all? So next I did what I call the Motel 6 experiments. In this case, I just got them a room. So there's a pair and there, a pair. And, and, and no competition. There's blinders so they can't see what's going on next door. I wish I could say the same for the hotel I'm in tonight. <laughs> Woke me up this morning. But at any rate, it's a simple test. We allow them to be together. And then we collect the eggs. And we simply determine how many are unfertilized versus how many are fertilized as a measure of male fertility. It's a very complicated assay procedure. I'm being obnoxious. There's an undergrad going one, two, three. I think he became an accountant. And at any rate, if you do that, you find out that these atrazine-treated males, no competition, only fertilize about 15% of a female's eggs compared to about 90, 85 to 90% for a control. And they lose out for two reasons, because there's no competition. They're in separate rooms. One, they don't even try. They just sit there and watch the females lay eggs. Two, even when they try, here's what the testes look like, sliced up under the microscope for control and atrazine. What you're looking at, I'm going to blow this histology up, is see, see all that? Soldiers, ready to go, that sperm in that testis. But if I blow this atrazine treat, look, there's just a little cellular debris. They don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior. And even if they do, they don't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm because atrazine decreases testosterone so much. So we published another paper. We call it Atrazine Induces Complete Feminization and Chemical Castration and Male African Clawed Fraud. Another PNAS paper, chemical castration, chemical castration. Grown up work. The company hates the term chemical castration. That's why I put it in the title. That's the kind of brother I am. The other thing that's important about this paper, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, who worked with Dan Buckle? See, there's Dan Buckles right there. Eight undergraduates co-authored this paper. Every one of them now has either an MD, a PhD, or both. And I'm equally proud of that. The last frog story I'm going to tell you is we decided to look at the North American leopard frog this time. And the North American leopard frog, if you expose it to atrazine, here's testis. And here you see all this junk in the trunk. That's what I call it. These are eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testis. We published this in Nature, because I, th I thought it was a big deal. In fact, though, I broke, not, not curfew, what's it called? Embargo. I broke embargo. I probably broke curfew, too. But I broke embargo because you're not supposed to share data when you submit it to Nature. And I broke embargo because I sent it to the EPA. And I said, look what atrazine does to the North American leopard frog. And the EPA says, well, that's an interesting finding, Dr. Hayes. I still have the email. And I said, but we do not view this as an adverse effect that would stimulate re-review and assessment of atrazine. Not an adverse effect. Interesting, but not an adverse effect. Now, my wife, who's going to kill me if she knows I showed this slide, <laughs> tells me there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. And based on the G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip she had on my hand when my son was born, I'm going to have to give her that. Nothing more painful. But I would guess, and I think the men in the room would agree with me on this, I would guess that a dozen chicken eggs in my testicle would have to be in the top five. But the EPA says it's not an adverse effect, so keep using the atrazine. At this point, we now ask, and the reason that we use the North American leopard frog is we wanted to know, is this a laboratory artifact? Or can we find this effect in the wild? Is this a real, is this a real thing? And so to give you an idea, because I haven't told you yet, to give you an idea what we're working with, this is a log scale. And, and here's how much atrazine the package recommends you apply. 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. What we're using in my lab is about 0.1, not about, 0.1 parts per billion. So 
the average farmer is using levels that are 290 million times higher than we use in my laboratory. If you look at the minimum and maximum in the literature from agriculture runoff, temporary pools, permanent water, precipitation, here's what we're using. There's enough atrazine in rainwater. Goes up on clouds, come down half a million pounds, come down in the rainwater every year. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to chemically castrate and feminize frogs. Here's what the EPA says is safe in your drinking water, 30 times higher than what we know to be effective. In fact, <laughs> I got an email from Environmental Health and Safety at my university. They said, we're concerned about the, your experiments. What are you going to do with the wastewater when you're done with the experiment? <laughs> you know where this is going, right? Well, I emailed them back. I said, I'm going to take it home and drink it, because it's guaranteed to have 30 times. See, I thought it was funny. <laughs> not, not so much the h and S. Not so much. The bottom line is, here's a frog. Now, now this is a frog gonad from the wild. This is no longer from the lab. If I sli it looks normal. But if I slice it up, and the, the color's going to be different because of the stain we use under the microscope. If I slice it up and blow it up and blow it up, instead of sperm, they've got eggs in the testis. We call them testicular oocytes in our nature paper. Grown up word. The company tried to have the paper retracted. You know why? They said I made up a word. <laughs> that was the only thing they could find wrong with my paper, is I made up a word. You know what my response was? Aren't all words made up before they're words? <laughs> Plus, I went to Harvard. I can make up a word. Come on. So here's what we showed. Here's where most of the atrazine is used in red. You can figure out what the scale is. We did a transect. We did a, we did a transect where we control for, for latitude. I'm being obnoxious. This is Highway I-80, and we were driving to a conference <laughs> in Indiana, <laughs> and we collected water frogs along the way. I got a nature paper. Now, I ain't that fuel efficiency. But <laughs> the point is, we not only showed that hermaphrodites only occurred where there was atrazine and vice versa, but we showed that we could take animals from one of the red dots and raise them in clean water in the lab, and they wouldn't come out hermaphrodites. And we could take animals from one of the blue dots and raise them in atrazine, and they would be hermaphrodites. So it wasn't just correlation. We also had cause and effect. Another nature paper. I became a full professor. I mean, I did some other stuff too, but nature paper didn't hurt. <laughs> Here's the last thing I'm going to tell you about frogs. As we started working in Salinas, how many people have eaten from Salinas? Everybody raise your hand. 85% of the country's green vegetables come out of Salinas. You've eaten from Salinas. It turns out that we did a study here because we wanted to know now, and I was talking to people about lab and field stuff, right? So we wanted to know, because not just atrazine is used here. A dozen other chemicals are used, and there's uh, 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 erosion and silt in the water. There's high temperatures. There's a lot of other factors going on. And we wanted to understand that, that interaction. And so we started working in Salinas. And I'm going to take a break for a minute from all the biology and stuff to talk to you about Salinas, because Steinbeck and East of Eden wrote about Salinas in 1952. That's just a few years before we started using all the chemicals in agriculture. Steinbeck said about Salinas, Salinas was surrounded and penetrated with swamps, with tool-filled ponds, and every pond spawned thousands of frogs. With the evening, the air was so full of their song that it was a kind of roaring silence. It was a veil, a background, and his sudden disappearance as after a clap of thunder was a shocking thing. It is possible if in the night the frog song should have stopped, everyone in Salinas would have awakened feeling that there was a great noise. In their millions, the frog songs seem to have a beat and a cadence. And perhaps it is the ear's function to do this, just as it is the eye's business to make stars twinkle. I, 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 didn't, I didn't pay attention to a lot of the non-science stuff that they made me study at Harvard. We call it breath courses. But I wish I had now because of the following. This is what Steinbeck said. This is the sound now of the native frogs in Salinas and the 10 years that I've been working there. I haven't heard a single native frog call in that time. And I think what's so important about that piece is that this wasn't a piece of scientific literature. The frog songs were so important that a literary artist devoted a half a page to it. And now it's gone. 
And I'm not going to tell you it's gone because of atrazine and pesticides. The number one cause is habitat loss. But the point is, chemicals are playing a critical role in the decline of amphibians. 80% globally of amphibian species are in decline. I call this from silent spring to silent night because in much the same way that Rachel Carson taught that the death of birds and the role of pesticides in those declines in birds was a warning to us, our silent spring. In much the same way, I feel like, I believe, our silent night is equally a warning to us. I showed a slide here from Lake Nabugabu, and, and it's a slide showing runoff from a crop that gets collected and it's the sole source of drinking and cooking and bathing water for this nearby village in Uganda. Here's my village. You know, I live somewhere up there, but my water, I don't have to take a yellow container up to get it, my water just comes from there. And we make these assumptions that somehow our fancy government agencies wouldn't let anything bad be in our water, unlike you know, this Uganda that doesn't have these agencies. Certainly Flint, Mission, Flint, Michigan can know that that's not true. And I'm here to tell you that it's not true in the US as well. So this is a quote from a colleague of mine who said, in ecoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. But I've already told you about not just one population, and not correlation, control experiments, but more than one species, more than one genera, more than one family of frogs show this effect. It turns out that every vertebrate class that's been examined, and now I'm going to be that scientist that brags about stuff that he didn't do. Because I published a paper with 22 scientists from 12 different countries. I emailed everybody in the world who worked on atrazine. I said, let's write a paper. Now, not everybody responded. <laughs> But of those who did, 22 people from 12 different countries have independently showed reproductive effects of atrazine. And in part, I, I have to admit, I was motivated to do this because the company was saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with atrazine. It's just this crazy guy from Berkeley. OK, I'm going to go with the crazy guy from Berkeley part. But my science was good. Here's what I found. In fact, by the way, we, we coined the word gonadotoxin in this paper. <laughs> Pissed them off. They wrote letters, tried to have it retracted. But here's what we found out. Here's my frog testis. Sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. This is a study in fish in Belgium. Sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. This is a study of uh, 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 caiman. It's like a big alligator in Argentina. Sperm in the testis, give it, give it atrazine, no sperm. This is a rat. I didn't know these people. This is a rat. This is in Croatia and done in Nigeria. Sperm in the testis, give it atrazine, no sperm. And another scientist in Pakistan showed the same thing in birds and quail. So this effect was being shown independently in, in, in just about every animal, every vertebrate class, certainly, that you can imagine. What's more is, is the sperm going down because testosterone goes down, like we suggested in frogs? This is work in fish by a group in England showing testosterone goes down. My work in frogs, this is work in rats. So this effect that we had published was being shown now all over the world. What's more is a colleague of mine, Shauna Swan, showed the following. She looked at humans, at human males, you can't do experiments, but she looked in Columbia, Missouri, and she showed that men who have atrazine in their urine, 0.1 parts per billion is what we're using in my lab. Men who have significant atrazine in their urine have a low sperm count and are unable to get their wives pregnant. Oh, that's just the correlation. But experimentally, under controlled conditions, you reduce the sperm in every animal, including rats, that you're exposed to atrazine. Now watch my trick, because I'm going to squash the data down, because I changed the axis. See, the data's still there. And I squash it down because here are atrazine levels of fuel workers in California. Now I'm going to squash it down again. Here are atrazine levels of men who apply atrazine in California, 2,400 parts per billion. So men who apply atrazine. California have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that we know is associated with low sperm count in Columbia, Missouri, that we know would chemically castrate and feminize a frog. Think about it. These guys have enough atrazine in their urine that I could take the atrazine in their urine, dilute it 24,000 times, and use it to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 tanks of 30 tadpoles each. Now, little boy who likes frogs 
gets introduced to another grown-up term because 90% of these men are Latinx. Environmental racism, environmental justice. In addition to atrazine, they're exposed to chemicals like chlorpicrin, which was originally developed as a nerve gas in World War II. They're exposed to chemicals like 2,4-D, which was an herbicide and a component of Agent Orange used to destroy food in Vietnam and Cambodia during our wars in Southeast Asia. Many of these men have life expectancies of 40. Many of these men are the fathers of students who come to work with me in my lab. So now I have a completely different perspective than just a little boy who likes frogs. On the other half of the equation, does atrazine induce aromatase and cause estrogen production and egg production outside of my frogs? It turns out, here's my frogs with eggs in the testes, testicular oocytes. Here's fish. This was done by the US Geological Survey. And here's reptiles. This was done by a group in Canada. On the other half of the equation, you're not going to grow eggs in your testes. But aromatase is incredibly important in the development of breast cancer and prostate cancer. With regards to prostate cancer, here's a study in their own factory that showed that there's an 8.4-fold increase in prostate cancer and men who work in their factory bagging atrazine in a community that's 80% black, 80% African American. Just a correlation, but the same thing is shown, as I'll show you before we end today, in rats that are exposed to atrazine. What's more is there's a significant correlation between breast cancer and atrazine exposure in a study in Kentucky that compared women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine with women who live in the same community but don't drink their well water. What's more is, that's just correlation, but if you look at rats, again, testosterone goes down when exposed to atrazine, and there's a concomitant increase in estrogen. It's not my work. In fact, the company's labs produce these data. In addition, if you look at rats, and here's controls, and you expose them to atrazine, there's a significant increase in mammary cancer, which is just a correlation. Well, in this case, it's a controlled experiment, but it's in mammals that are a proxy, rats that are a proxy for us. In humans, if you take a human cancer cell line, that doesn't normally express aromatase and make estrogen and expose it to atrazine in vitro, it starts expressing aromatase and making estrogen. Just like we've seen in frogs, just like we've seen in fish, just like we've seen in reptiles, just like we've seen in birds, just like we've seen in rats, human cells respond the same way because they make estrogen the same way. I went to visit them. Yoo-hoo-hoo, I knocked on the door. I still think they should spell their name with a Y instead of an I. <laughs> Nobody listens to me. Their factory is in a community that's 80% black. They are, I'll tell you why I bring that up in a second. They have a pipe that flows directly into the Mississippi River. 1.2 million pounds of atrazine flow into the Gulf of Mexico down the Mississippi every year. As far as I know, nobody's studying the impact on the Gulf. What's more is most of the community looks like this. It's a low-income black community. And I bring this up because of the following. Here are the top 13 cancers that you're going to get now living in the US. And red are the ones that you, 11 of the 13, the ones that you're more likely to get if you're black, if you're African American. What's more is if you look at mortality relative to Caucasian or white Americans, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers if you're black, if you're African-American. And this is control for access to health care and socioeconomic status. I bring this up for the following reason. My colleagues who study cancer, who are experts in cancer, say less than 30% of cancer is explained by genetics. It's an environmental disease. What that means is when your doctor tells you you're more likely to get breast or prostate cancer if your uncle, your sister, your aunt, or somebody in your family has cancer, they're not telling you that you have bad genes. They're telling you that you've been exposed to the same crap as the rest of your family. And if you're a person of color, if you're an immigrant, if you're low income, you're more likely to live in and more likely to work in areas that we know you will be exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. I'm all down. Yeah, I got invited to give a talk for <laughs> Coleman for the Cure. They didn't invite me back, and <laughs> they don't pay me no money. I called my talk an ounce of prevention. 
Because most of our research focuses on a few cell lines that don't come from black or Latinx individuals. So even if they find the cure, it's, more li it's not likely to be relevant to the people who are more likely to get and more likely to die because they're being exposed differentially. The problem is, I think, that there's no money in prevention. You can't put your name the way you can on a drug. You can't put your name on prevention. What inspired me more was, and this is work from a graduate student, as she showed that a breast cancer cell line responds just like everything else we've studied, just like fish, just like amphibians, just like reptiles, just like birds, just like rats, just like other cell lines. If you expose a breast cancer cell line to atrazine, it starts making aromatase. That's significant because estrogen, the product of aromatase, is what, what drives breast cancer. These cells express aromatase, they make estrogen locally, and it's that locally produced estrogen that causes the damaged cells to divide and grow, to metastasize. Turns out that the local expression of aromatase is so important in breast cancer treatment that the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole that works by blocking aromatase so that you don't make estrogen, so that your damaged cells don't grow and divide. How might that be impacted by the most common contaminant of drinking water, which is known to do the opposite, which turns on aromatase, increases estrogen, induces breast cancer in rats, and is associated with breast cancer in humans? Turns out I'm probably not the first person who thought about this connection. You can see this is from their website. Novartis Oncology offers treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. I published a study called The One Stop Shop chemical causes and cures for breast cancer. They got upset because my point was the company that gives us 80 million pounds of atrazine in the year 2000 was simultaneously selling a drug that blocks aromatase to treat breast cancer. So if you were living in the Midwest taking letrozole to treat your breast cancer, it had to fight it out with the chemical produced by the same company that does exactly the opposite, induces aromatase. They wrote all kinds of letters to my dean my daddy lives in South Carolina. That's who they should have been writing to if they wanted something to happen. I want to show you one last thing. Because the turning point for when I realized that I have to be more than just a little boy who likes frogs came from studies that I didn't do. I would argue that my love for these aquatic organisms and the impact that these chemicals have on these aquatic organisms tells us quite a bit about an organism that I didn't realize I cared so much about. And I mean that in a sort of a hypothetical, I mean a, a creative way. Because I would argue that a developing fetus in a contaminated amniotic fluid is not all that different than one of my frogs in a contaminated tank or a contaminated pond. We now know that your children, should you choose to have them, would be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb. Most of them, we have no idea what they do. We do know that those fetuses need testosterone, estrogen, thyroid hormone, cortisol, the exact same hormones that my frogs need. A study, I'm going to show you some rat studies now. And uh, who's listening? Why do I study frogs? What? I'm a little boy who likes frogs. I'm pretty sure people who study rats weren't little boys and girls who like rats. I'm pretty sure they wanted to understand humans. Well, the people who study rats, this is all peer-reviewed and published, have shown that atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer in rats. The people who study rats have shown that atrazine causes immune failure in rats. The people who study rats have shown that in utero, atrazine results in neural damage when they're exposed. And these are the studies now that moved me more than anything I've done in my own career. An EPA laboratory, in fact, showed that rats exposed during pregnancy, if they're exposed to atrazine, they're more likely to have an abortion. Of those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. The sons are born with the prostate of an old man. Of those rats that don't abort, the daughters 
are born with impaired mammary development such that when they grow up, they can't feed their offspring properly, so their offspring show retarded growth and development. Again, these are people who are trying to understand humans. I believe that's why you study rats. And what I'm telling you is that that rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. That rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my little girl, when I think about the fact that my grandchildren, that your grandchildren, could be affected by chemicals that we're using today. Your grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today. And it makes me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs. I have a responsibility to my mom to publish things in a place where she can have access to information. I have a responsibility to other academics. I have a responsibility to the public to not just publish in these esoteric places that are going to get me tenures and professor step this. Much bigger responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs. Speaking of responsibility, I'm going to end on time. So I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for coming out tonight. And I know, again, I know we started a little late, but I want to respect your time and make sure that we end on time. Hi, thanks a lot for that. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, if we want to look at more pictures of frog gonads, do you have a, a recommendation where we can look? <laughs> well, no, no, I, I have serious questions. <laughs> I was going to invite you. No, <laughs> he does have a place, doesn't he? <laughs> He's got a suggestion. So actually, two questions. Mm -hmm. um, why did that company hire you in the first place to study their product? That doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and, and the second question is, sort of answered it at the end there, but if you take the frog that's supposed to atrazine and put them in clean water for a year, are the effects reversible, at least partially? So let me answer the second question first. So the question is, is it irreversible? It depends. So in endocrinology, we, we um, refer to what's called activational and organizational effects. So effects that happen during development are permanent. So for example, in humans, the equivalent would be when testosterone stimulates you to grow a penis, if you castrate somebody or take the hormone away, the penis doesn't go away. It's a permanent effect. So the effects producing animals with ovaries that lay eggs during early development, those are irreversible. So you can take them out of the atrazine and they will stay females for life. The effects that we get in adults, like the lowering of testosterone and the decreased mating behavior, if you remove them, they'll, reco they'll recover and turn to normal. So those are activational effects. Um, why did the company hire me in the first place? That's a long story that requires a little bit of, well, I guess it's not speculation. I have data. The company already knew. Okay, so I was late. I was hired as a group of science, scientists. I used the term loosely for some of the people I worked with. But there was a reptile person, a fish person. There was a bunch of us. And, and some long-term people who worked for the company but also had ties, as in they had vice presidents in the company who were their students previously. And they already knew even before they hired me. The idea is I was a brand new assistant professor with a son and a daughter on the way, just starting out at a time when you know, NSF money was scarce. And it was easy money. These, these guys were paying me $1,000 a day. If I e literally, if I emailed the company and said, hey, I thought about atrazine today, I'd get a check for $1,000. And the idea is you capture young and upcoming people early in their career 
you get hooked on that money, and, and then you're theirs. And what that allows them to do is it allows them to go to the EPA and say, we're spending millions of dollars to study this problem, even without your telling us. It also allows them then to control, till they met Tyrone, to control when the data comes out, because they control when you publish and when you, and the idea is they would have paid me for life as long as I kept quiet and did whatever I wanted to until they told me. At such time that they figure out a new product or a way to add another methyl group to make it go away, then they're now ahead of all the other companies that weren't doing the studies. And they've done this. They've done it. That's not publicly known, but they did this with Scotchgard. The formula changed with Scotchgard because they had people working on it, because it turns out it showed up in bald eagle's eggs. They figured out it was a problem. They changed the formula, and then they come out ahead of all the other companies. Not, sorry, not, that was a different company that did that, but they work with the same scientists. In <laughs> Others, yes? Um, California listed on the Prop 65 as a reproductive toxin, but all that means is that means it goes on the slate for review for whether or not it'll be regulated. But in essence, all it really means is that there's a labeling now that lets everybody know if you're using a product with atrazine. The EPA has, after 20 years, finally issued a report saying that the overwhelming um, preponderance of data says that atrazine is a reproductive toxin in the environment and a danger to plant life and animal life. Now, whether or not it gets to one, the EPA has never regulated an agrochemical. Everybody always says DDT. DDT is still not banned. It's just that it's ineffective and, and, and individual states regulate DDT. So if the EPA did cancel the registration or ban it, it would, it would hist correct me if anybody knows different, it would be a historical first. Usually what happens is the companies run from liability and voluntarily drop the compound and, and come up with an alternative. So I'm, I'm not hopeful that compounds like who, oh, snails. So compounds like um, tributyl 10, which was causing hermaphroditic and female development, and, and um, that was banned by an act of Congress, not by the EPA. So far, and especially in the current administration, but let's not get political. Do you know if there's any sort of like cheap, reliable home test that people can use to see like if they have a lot of atrazine in their own drinking water? I do, so. There are what are called ELISA tests for atrazine. I, I don't think they're all that reliable. We've, we've tried using them in my lab. In some states, I, I know in my city in California, there's a, a bank of chemicals that's tested and we get a report, I don't know, every six months or something like that. So it depends on what state you live in. In some states, you can send in your water and ask for the test. And in some states, it, it, it costs a lot of money. Some states do it for free. Some states, you'd actually get charged for it. Um, So it's, it's inconsistent. Uh, how, so I understand that the effect of astrazine in the environment is great, but like how, how long would it take for the effects to diminish and what would be the best steps to uh, speeding that up? Now, let me clarify. Do you mean how long does it stay in the environment? Or you mean how long would it take the cleanup effects in wildlife, or how long would it take for human exposure? Uh, to, like to how long would it take for it to go back down to a safe for the environment level? That, that I don't know the answer to. So the only data I can reference is the European Union banned it. it well, France banned it way before that. Um, and the reason that France banned it is because it was still in the rainfall coming over from Germany. So the whole European Union denied regulatory approval. And the last bit of data I saw in France, which was about, at the time, a decade of data, the levels in the groundwater hadn't changed. So on the surface, it has a half-life that you can read. There's tons of papers published on it. But in the groundwater, when it's under the ground, it's variable, and it, and it may be in the ground for decades. It's not like DDT that ends up in fat and you know, doesn't break down and things like that. But in the groundwater, it's, it's pretty stable. And, and there's no like way humans can get rid of? No, that's actually not true. So if you're an adult and you drink a glass of atrazine, it's highly water soluble. You urinate that out and you'll be done. The problem with humans are the ones that I showed. And one, before anybody asks, Brita Filter takes it out. I should have made a deal with Brita Filter a long time ago. <laughs> Got a little kickback, a little something, something on this, but I don't. But Brita Filter even says on the box, removes atrazine. So, so if you're a human, your kidneys will filter it out and you'll get rid of it. The problem is twofold. 
If you're a fetus that's trapped in a contaminated amniotic fluid, you drink the water that you urinate into. And so if you're a fetus, you're constantly exposed. The other part of the problem is if you're a factory worker or a farm worker, you drink a glass today, you pee it out tomorrow, but then you go back to work and you get exposed again. The other problem with farm workers and factory workers is it's not because they're drinking it. Those high levels are because of dermal exposure and inhalation. So even if they have access to Brita filters and filtering, and even if they go home and urinate regularly, they're still repeatedly exposed um, uh, to the atrazine. Or in Australia, for example, where they use atrazine to keep down the algae in swimming pools. You literally have little kids swimming in it. I just wanted to ask, um, I'm a high school uh, biology and, and research teacher, and we've seen you know, the clip of uh, the thin green line, which you were featured <laughs> in, in like 2008. As far as like a call for action, especially for young people, what would you recommend? Because my students get horrified to seeing these things, and then they don't know, need to know what, they, what can they do. Um, that's really the, the next step I want to do. I never thought I would be the kind of person to say, write to your congressperson. <laughs> but writing to your congressperson is important. I became very, ironically, Minnesota was trying to ban atrazine. I learned a lot about how seriously they take, especially letters from children that are from classrooms when they know, because kids go home and they tell their parents things. And, and it, I mean, it still hasn't been banned in Minnesota, but from the legislators that I work with, it would make a huge difference. There are ways that you can go online when the EPA is reviewing a chemical and, and give your opinion. You don't have to be a scientist or an expert. They technically are supposed to read your opinion and use that in their, in their decision. Um, I guess it's a matter of every little thing counts. I mean, I can't point to you directly and say, 50 people wrote in and then this chemical got banned, but it's the, certainly the best thing they could do as a classroom or as individuals. And, and I think just making decisions about what kinds of things you purchase and, and you know, how you feed yourself at home. Because I mean, we're not just talking about atrazine, right? We're talking about um, trying to do your best to um, purchase foods that don't use excessive pesticides that aren't traveling from all the way across the country. So Voting sue the dollars. bastards. Sorry? So sue the bastards. Why haven't we sued them out of existence? So, you may know that Monsanto just lost a big lawsuit over glyphosate, and there's a class action lawsuit coming on. That's one big way to do it. Atrazine, uh, the company was sued in a class action lawsuit and lost $108 million. The problem is they have lots and lots and lots of money, and they keep going. There are other lawsuits for atrazine coming up. I haven't been a part of those lawsuits. I've been um, an advisor to the lawyer for no money, despite what you might read on the web. I'm not a high-paid anything. Um, so that, that's one way, and that's one way to hit them because they're worried about liability and losing money and, and, and bad publicity. Thank you. Uh, you're a master storyteller. I wish I had your acumen for doing that because you're really putting out a very important message, and uh, I actually have a problem with the concept of soothing, okay? And here's my point, is that uh, I'm in the environmental business, and I have to tell you that What's clean today is not clean tomorrow. Yeah. Why is that? Because we've got, you mentioned 300 chemicals. There's 5,000 chemicals that we have no clue what, uh, what, we're, uh, what we're looking at. The issue I have is that, and the message, I think, the important message is, and what you are doing is bringing this to the public in a way that we can all understand. And what I think it says is that uh, we, we live in a very wasteful society. If we want the trappings we want around us, we want the food from Salinas in our grocery stores here in New Jersey, there's a price to pay for that. And we all have to understand that price. It isn't just the evil empire you know, poisoning us. We want this stuff. And uh, uh, so, <laughs> so the, the, the message needs to get out, I, I think. And I, I don't know, maybe you're con I think what you're doing is, is exactly right, but but it is, you know, the polluter will pay. We, the people, are the polluter. Well, but I think, and, and here's why I'll disagree with you a little bit. I think there, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a slide I have later, I mean, I mean, that I have loaded here in my talk, but I'm just going to try to quote it. The EPA said in the New Yorker article that you heard about that a monetary value is placed on disease, shortened lives, and, and, you know, that are caused by these chemicals and weighed against the benefit of keeping, keeping them in use. And the problem is the benefits go to the manufacturers and the people who are paying the cost are often people of color, first generation, low income individuals that don't have the power and that don't have the lawyers and don't have the
the funding. And in the case of atrazine in particular, atrazine increases corn yield by 1.2%, a crop that we eat less than 20% of. So it's not about making food available and feeding the world. It's about that 1.2% bringing $100 million more corn that we're not eating in the first place that, that then ultimately goes back by the, to the manufacturer. Part of the problem is that 90% of the seeds that we use to grow our food are owned now by four chemical companies. So their job is, their, their goal is not to sell as many seeds as possible. Their goal is to sell as much pesticide as possible, which means things like 80 to 90% of our GMO crops aren't there to make more nutritious or drought resistant or, or, or crops. They're there to make the crops dependent on the chemicals that are being sold by the parent companies. And so that's when I think the lawsuits will make a difference because as, as a corporation trying to make money, that's when they start to realize. They're not going to listen to low income, first generation, minority immigrant populations. They're going to listen to a lawyer who's hitting their pocket and making them lose that money. So there is a federal agency that can help, but it's not doing their job, the EPA. Yes. They have the Toxic Substances Control Act, which is a, it's an atrocity. They're letting these chemicals out without, you know, they're trusting. I agree. They're, they're trusting the, uh, the industry. Yes. One more question here. All right. Um, so, um, I'm a black male in science, and you're a black male in science. And I guess what I'm interested in asking is, what's it like when your entire life and everything that has ever been told to you, and everything that you've done is so different from the narrative that is pushed onto you as a black male? And so how do you deal with kind of like this paradox that, like what's it like to exist and how do you cope with this? Because like these spaces aren't meant for us, and we're not supposed to be here. And if the world had had it our way, we wouldn't exist. So what's the, yeah, how do you deal with this? That's my question. So you're asking an interesting question because a lot of the, you know, I chose not to go into it here, but a lot of the industry's attack on me was really based on, um, you know, they actually had a psychological profile done and they actually had somebody professionally who wrote up language that was supposed to discourage me. Things like, you know, you don't dress right, and you don't present right, and you're not a scientist, you're a preacher, a comedian, an entertainer. And so this idea of, you know, sort of imposter syndrome, and, and they, they really target it in much the same way that they target women environmental activists, that you're not a real scientist, and you're emotional, and you're not thinking right, and et cetera. So a lot of the target, a lot of the, the um, um, uh, flack that I got from the company was really targeted at the fact that I am a, a, a black male. Um, stuff that I won't go into in this, in this whole big crowd. And I, and I think in that case, I embraced who I was more, and they didn't, know how to, you know, they didn't really know how to deal with it. And the idea that, you know, I used to say, I brought the hood to Harvard, now I'm going to bring Harvard back to the hood. The idea is, I can, I can address you in a way that you can't understand, but I can speak, if I wanted to, I can speak and dress just like you, and I, certainly I can write papers just like you in those places. But that was the thing that they, that they really tried to use there, and I think that's one of the things that, that made this blow up into such a big media um, complex. But it's, it's, it has not been easy and still is not easy, especially recognizing and knowing that people of color are the real targets, are really paying, the, we just talked about, the big price and the cost that the EPA talks about, and that we don't have that voice. That as an immigrant, you're not going to go and complain about, oh, I've been exposed to this, especially in this political climate, when your fear is, I'm going to lose my job, I'm going to get deported. So it, a, a lot of that became very important in how they dealt with me and how I responded to them. 